Okay, so I will do the talk in English, okay? Um, so, yeah, it's uh, 45, so we can start. So, well, uh, thank you for coming. Um, and uh, first, I want to start the talk just um, with a round of applause for you for being in, a, in an event, in a community event like this one. It's super important that you attend this kind of events, meetups, communities, so please, a round of applause for you. And I'm going to talk about test containers. Is anybody here that doesn't know anything about test containers? Fine, you're in the right place. Um, so, first, uh, I want to introduce basically who am I, because I assume you don't know me. Um, what can you expect of this presentation? So, uh, as the, so for the very first moment that I say, which is the expectations for you, if, it does, if it's not what you were expecting, the door is over there. The project. So this is a talk based on a real project. We use test containers in Red Hat for uh, well, several times, uh, like uh, two years. So I want, I'm going to explain test containers, but with a real use case. What, do we, what did we want to test in this project? Because why we choose uh, test containers? Which was the problem that we wanted to solve using test containers, not just using JUnit or any other library? Obviously, I need to explain what it is test containers, especially for those two of you. Uh, and which is the usage of test containers, especially in our project? How, how did we uh, use test containers? Um, also introducing a new chapter in this presentation that is about the AI coverage for test containers. So test containers have some modules that are covering AI. Um, and if I have time, I can also show Quarkus. Some, how did we use test containers with Quarkus? Because the real example is using a spring, but the world doesn't end in spring. There are lots of things out there. Uh, everybody of you knows about uh, Quarkus? No? Perfect. <laughs> and some references if you want to just explore more about this. So first of all, this is me, um, Jonathan Villa, and I'm Java champion, and also uh, one of the leaders of the Barcelona Java community in Barcelona, um, and also one of the co-founders of JBCN Conf and DevBCN. It's a conference that we run in Barcelona every year. I've been developer for more than 30 years with lots of different languages, but I have to say that the one that I loved the most was Delphi. Anybody used Delphi here? Yeah. Don't be shy, don't be shy, just say it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but now I work as a developer advocate for Sonar. It's the company that is behind SonarCube. All of you know about SonarCube? Perfect. If you want to know more about me, just uh, scan the QR code. Uh, okay, I always forget about this. And I need to introduce what is Sonar, just because, first of all, they pay my trip here. So um, Sonar has like three different projects products, SonarLint, SonarCube, and SonarCloud. Uh, all of them are free um, in the basic uh, edition. SonarLint is free for all, everywhere, every time, and it's a linter that you can run in the IDE. And the good thing is that it covers more than 30 languages at the same time. So you can scan Kubernetes, Docker, Terraform, Java, and JavaScript, Python uh, at the same time. SonarCube, that can also be free in the community edition. You can download it and run it, and don't pay anyone. And, and it will also analyze your projects. And SonarCloud, that it is also free for open source projects. So if you run an open source project, definitely use SonarCloud. It's free, and uh, you will have a, a clear idea of how clean is your code. Or maybe not, you don't like. Uh, uh, if you want to know more, just go to sonarsource.com or ping me. Yeah? So uh, what can you expect from this talk? It's about my real experience 
and well, a real case, but it's not a magical, a magistral lecture about anything. I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm here to show my experience and to show my little knowledge about test containers. Uh, and definitely, it's not the way. Is, has anybody, uh, so is here anybody following the Mandalorian? So this is not the way. Okay, so the project that, I, that we had was basically a camel module that was serving as an integration module. And the flow was the user was sending something, a payload to that module. That module was sending this to an ingress. It's a third party project, well, from Red Hat, but it's another project. This project was sending the payload and a few transformations to an S3 bucket and also sending the same payload to Kafka that was sending this to a topic in Kafka. Our module was taking this, uh, was reading from this topic in Kafka, was sending this payload to a key server that it is a JBPM engine doing some calculations and some transformations. This returned as a value. We stored this value in S3, but also everything was managed by uh, RBAC security that was running in a Postgres database. Also, our module was storing some information in Postgres. This is all the, the flow that our project was following. And what did we want to test? Obviously, unit tests are out of this scope. For sure, you, are, you have unit tests. And you also can have integration tests for, with test containers, we will see later. We can test the integration of our application with the different layers, one by one. In this case, we were running an end-to-end -end test, testing all those layers. So what we wanted to have were end-to-end -end tests covering the S3 connection, the Kafka connection, and like the PostgreSQL connection but also the version of those external services. So we were running with a specific versions of each service. This, in this case, KIE 7.3 and Postgres 9.6. But we also wanted to check the integration of our application with the different layers. Uh, and, it's, and it's especially tricky with Camel. Camel, uh, anybody uses Camel here or has used Camel? Spring integration? OK, well, at least. OK, with Camel, you connect to the different layers using strings. So you define the parameters of the adapter in a string. So you can mess with the strings that you put in the, in the connection. So we wanted to check that all those parameters were uh, correct, especially uh, the, the position in the Kafka index, for instance. So we wanted to check that everything was fine, even with uh, S3. And also checking that the async processes that we, we've seen before, that we had a lot of async processes, were running fine, and not that we were clashing between services or having timeouts or whatever. So we wanted to check everything. And also a special configuration of those external services. We had Kie with a specific configuration. So we wanted to check that our application was running with that specific configuration. But we wanted to have this connected in our CI pipeline. So every time that we were trying to merge to main, all of this had to be tested in, in order to avoid or allow the merge to the main branch. In this, in this case, we, ha we, we have here two screenshots. One is coming from GitHub, and the other one is coming from Travis. So this is a process that took a lot, 47 minutes, uh, a lot of logs. But in the end, this PR could be merged because all the checks were passing. That's why we checked test containers. Let's see how test containers can help us. And what is test containers at this time? Basically, you have your application, you have your un JUnit tests, 
and then you have a test container module. But the important part here is that the test container module is using Docker for Java, and in this case, it was for Java. And finally, it's using a Docker container. It can also use uh, other versions. So it, you can change the context to use Podman containers. But uh, in this case, it was Docker for Java. So in the end, you have your JUnit test. And finally, you have your Docker container. Test containers comes with a lot of pre-built modules. And also, it can run on all of these languages. Some of them are like the main languages, Java and Go. And the rest are community-driven uh, language support. It runs with Go, Rust, well, lots of them. And yeah, for the Java version, the last one is the 1.19.7, uh, uh, sorry. The two projects, the two main projects are Java and Go, and both have a lot of committers behind. So Java has more than 400 uh, contributors, and the Go one has almost 200 contributors behind. So it's, both of them are very active projects. And these are the community ones. So we can have like the Python uh, language support with more than 100 contributors just to Elixir one with four contributors. But you can choose. There are lots of languages covered by test containers. And these are the out-of-the-box modules. It serves lots of things, databases, HTTP servers, reverse proxies, you name it. Here are, at this, uh, at this moment, we're 22 DB modules and more than 19 tools modules. So uh, test containers is giving you out-of-the-box pre-built modules that are going to be very easy to run. One of the important things here is that in order to avoid clashes with uh, ports, test containers is relying on uh, Docker and ultimately in the, on the operating system in order to not use the exposed port. When you have a service Postgre in a 5432 port, you can have three Postgres, each of them apparently running in the 5432 port. The point here is that Docker will run all of those containers, and, they, and it will assign random ports to all of them. The trick here is that later we need to know which is the port that has been used in order to connect to that, that container. So in this case, we see that we have a container with three different uh, ports. We expose one. And test containers, using an ephemeral port, it's going to give us a real port that starts on 32,000 and, I don't know, the upper limit, I can't remember. Um, so our application needs to connect to the 32 port. We will see later how can we get the, the, the real port. And for test containers, usually, Life is ephemeral, and that's, that's the nice thing with test containers. We have our JUnit test. We'll, we have several tests on it, and then what we need, usually, is that we need to test isolated every test, right? So we need a clean environment for every test. There are like two options. One is we start containers in each test, method test, and after every method test, that those containers are uh, released, are removed. The other one is, well, we know we are not going to mess uh, between tests, so we are going to start the container at the beginning of the test suite, and we are going to release it in the end. These are like the two main options. but. We can always hack this. With test containers, we can also say it's an experimental uh, feature, and you need to tweak a bit in order to make it run. What we can say is, OK, I want to reuse this container. What's going to happen is that every time that we create a container and we start a container, 
Test containers will search for the hash of each container, and if it finds a container with that hash, it will reuse that container. Those containers are not going to be released, so you need to release them manually on your CI process, or if it's in, uh, in development mode, you manually, you need to do it. This is how it works. The manual start, it will search for a container with that hash. It, if, if it exists, it will reuse it. If not, it will create it. But this is not the usual case. So it should be that uh, containers are started and created and then released in every test. Everybody is with me? No, not every, eh, none of you are sleepy at this moment? No? Okay. So what can we do with, uh, with a container? Basically, what we can do is to define which container we want. We can start those containers. We can log the information of every container somewhere, and then we can connect to the containers, and finally we finish them and release them. To do that, okay, we will see in a moment the uh, specifications of each one of them. Um, okay, so now we have a clear idea of what are test containers, uh, out of the box modules, and how it basically it works under the hood, right? So in this particular project, in green we see real containers with real services. No mocks, no fakes, the real service that we had in production it was running on test containers. In yellow, uh, for obvious reasons, it was a substitute. Because we were connecting to uh, S3, and I don't want my tests to depend on connections to Amazon. So I need to replicate somehow the behavior of, uh, S, um, in this case, S3. There are two options. Either you use Minio or you use local stack. Local stack is a service that gives the same interfaces as uh, Amazon in several services. So for the real services, well, we were using a real Postgres in the a specific database, the application, the RBAC application, the key server, ingress, we will see what it is, Kafka, and uh, the other two were substitute. In the case of uh, in the case of the ingress, this is a a service that it's from Red Hat. There was no such a, a Docker Hub image for that. What we had is uh, the GitHub repository. So what we did was downloading the GitHub repository on the CI test process building the image at that moment and telling test containers to run or to create a container with the image that we built at that moment. So in order to define containers, we can just use the out of the box modules, PostgreSQL container, Kafka container, that's it. And then it's everything, it's optimized and I specify the parameters to start in this case, which is the database that it needs to create, and the user, and password. But we can also use it with a Docker file. And what it will do with this uh, new image from Docker file, what it will do is to get the file, and it will build a container. Or what we can do is to specify a Docker Hub image. In this case, it's Minio. It will download the image from Docker Hub or the registry, and it will start the container. So for our modules, what we had was generic containers for uh, Minio. So we were pulling the image from Docker Hub. In this case, we had two, because with Minio, we have like the service and we have the bucket and uh, one of the images was used to create the bucket. For Kafka, it was a, an out-of-the-box module, Kafka container. For Ingress, we were using an image, uh, a Docker file image. For local stack, we were using an already uh, built-in module. And for Kie, 
we were using the image. For RBAC, the same. And for the Postgre, we had like this uh, already built-in module. And to start containers, so we have our container created, defined, and now we need to start them. There are different ways. Either we can start them manually, or we can say, OK, no, we want to rely on the integration with test containers and the JUnit, and it will uh, run them. That, uh, we can do that either using for JUnit4 rules or using containers if we are using uh, also Spring. But we can also say, OK, I'm going to have these eight containers, but I don't want to run them one by one. What I want is, once I have all defined, I want you to start them in parallel. So test containers will start to run them all at the same time. In some cases, you can specify dependencies. In this case, you can see on the create buckets one that we have a depends on menu. That means test containers is not going to try to start this menu MC container. Uh, until the menu container has been started. Started or ready. We will talk about this concept uh, in a moment. Um, containers also output their log into the standard output. But we want to collect them into a logger, for instance. So we can say, OK, uh, it's, it's tiny, but it says with lock, with lock consumer, and then we are going to have a, an SLF4J uh, consumer. But the thing is that in that consumer, we will see all the lock, but with a prefix. This prefix that it is also set in the line, and we will see the lock for each container with a prefix for each one. So we will know uh, from which container is coming the information. Or we can specify manually, get logs, and we will get all of them. So now we need to connect to a container. So for that, we need uh, the IP. We will see uh, and the, the port. So we'll see in a minute. But when we create containers in some cases, I remember with, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, with Kafka, in the previous version, it was using uh, the other service, I can't remember. Zookeeper. Exactly. So it needed to connect to Zookeeper. And at that time, it was connecting using the like, uh, naming uh, connection. So in that case, we were putting both uh, containers in the same network. If not, all of the containers are in a default uh, network. So in this case, we were creating a, a network for them. And you can specify this with network aliases and with network. And then you create a network and you link containers to a network. And then in order to connect to those containers, you need to uh, ask the container, OK, tell me which is the, uh, in this case, container IP address and which is the first map port. And it will give me the random port that was created at the beginning. And then. I can connect to the port. When I said before that one container can depend on another, on the other container to be ready, it means that there are like two strategies. One is the wait strategy and the startup. The startup is the default one. That means when a container is running, it's ready. But in some cases, you need some processes to start. So the readiness becomes a result of a request or something. In this case, you can use the wait strategy, and you can define which is the logic to follow in order to say, yeah, I'm ready. You can wait for um, a request that returns a specific value or um, to, to find a log message in the log. In our case, we were using, in the first version, we were using a spring. 
So what we needed is, OK, I have all the containers running. But now, how can I tell Spring which are the ports for each container? For, for that case, at that time, we were using the annotation, the context configuration, specifying a class. And in the class, we were overriding the properties. So before Spring runs everything, it will come here. It will, we will override the values of those parameters. And then Spring will use them in order to connect services. But we can use dynamic properties with the Spring Boot. Um, in this case, we annotate with dynamic property source, and then we will specify or we'll add the registry uh, with all the parameters that are going to be in the registry with the properties. Or we can simply say anything in the properties file, and then uh, Spring will take care of the parameters, and it will connect the services. This is what well, with Spring Boot 3.1. And then when we have everything connected, we need to finish the containers. We can do it manually with stop, it's easy. Or we can use the automatical uh, release process. So if you had the rule or the container annotation, when our test finishes, if it's a static property, it's a static field, it will be released at the end of the test case. If it's an a instance property, then it will be released uh, after each method test. Everything clear here? Any questions so far? No? Yeah? What about the Docker Compose support? If I'm not wrong, yes. But I haven't tried Docker Compose with test containers. It is supported? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it is, but no, I haven't tried with. Uh, no, it's better because you can define the, all the containers and all the services. In the, in, in the Docker Compose, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we can continue with the AI support. So, Test Containers has also support for several vector databases uh, that they have, well, they, they've been adding uh, all of these uh, databases, but also to Olama that you can run like an LLM, LLM locally. To run an LLM locally, basically what you do is you specify the Olama container. When you start it, it doesn't have any model inside. So what we are going to do is to retrieve a model. And it will download the all mini LM. But then what we are going to do is with this image, so we started Olama empty. We download the model. And now what we are going to do is to commit this state to a new image. We call it whatever. But then we say, OK, and we are going to run Olama container again. And we are going to say this container serves as a substitute for any container running Olama. OK, so every time that you try to run Olama, you will run this one that contains the model. And finally, you use, in this case, as, uh, Lang4j. And, and you simply use the chat model from Olama, and uh, you connect to the service that you have started with the base URL. And then you can uh, ask the, the model questions, and you will return, uh, it will return answers. So then you can check. Tests with uh, AI are weird because probably you are not going to get deterministic results. So it's going to be hard. But at least what you can do is to test that the system works, not that the answers are correct, but that the system works. Uh, but yeah, they also have uh, support for, for AI. And now let me 
talk to you about Quarkus and the integration with test containers. Uh, so nobody knows about Quarkus. Quarkus is a framework, let's say, similar to Spring uh, and others like Micronaut or Helidon. Those frameworks are, from the very beginning, designed to be uh, Kubernetes um, uh, native friendly uh, framework. It supports several languages, all obviously JVM languages. But the point here for, for those frameworks is that they allow you to use GraalVM at the end in order to compile your Java application into a native artifact. That means you don't need the JVM installed in the machine. Um, what it is important for Quarkus is that it uses lots of open source libraries. So they are not inventing any, almost anything. So you still use uh, open source libraries. It's a very uh, live project with a lot of contributors. And I took a, a project from Spring, the Spring Pet Clinic REST project, and I did an experiment. I migrated uh, it to Quarkus, doing the same, uh, the same, having the same features. Basically, I'm comparing Spring JVM to Quarkus JVM and to Quarkus native. Um, in order to move from Quarkus JVM to Quarkus native, the only thing that we need to do is to add dash p native in the command line. Nothing else. You don't need to touch your code in order to move from one to the other. And the result was that the Spring application took almost seven seconds to start, and it took more than 400 megabytes of memory. With moving to Quarkus, in JVM, it took uh, half of the memory and uh, almost half uh, of time to start. But moving to the native artifact, we moved from, in this case, from seven seconds to 160 milliseconds. And remember, the only thing that I needed to do from going from Quarkus JVM to Quarkus native is to add dash p native in the command line. And test containers have a uh, well integration with Quarkus. Again, you can do uh, Quarkus test resource, and you can specify the test container resource, and you will start and stop them, uh, that it will be connected to your JUnit uh, lifecycle <coughs> this, this way. So you have this Quarkus test resource um, that it is creating in the init method creating a new PostgreSQL container. In the start, we are starting the container, and in the stop, we are closing the container. We can do it man manually. Or we can specify in the URL in the test uh, profile, TC, and then the, uh, the connection will be done directly. Or do nothing. Uh, do not specify anything in the test profile, in your properties file, and Quarkus will take care of that. If it discovers that there is a test containers thingy, it will connect the services. It's more or less the same thing as a Spring does, does with the latest uh, approach that I, that I showed. Basically, I'm reaching the end of the presentation. You have here all the references if you want to follow more uh, this topic. I need to uh, give uh, uh, a lot of thanks to Manuel that it is the maintainer of the Go library for uh, test containers. He helped me a lot. And I also totally recommend you that tomorrow this guy is going to have a talk about test containers, unfortunately about Spring Boot, but uh, tomorrow, track 3, uh, 12.45. So basically, that's it. Please uh, rate me uh, in, with this QR. 
say if you didn't like something, it will help me. And if you want to have the link for these slides, it's also this QR. And if you want to contact me, here you have my Twitter, email, and anything. I cannot give you more swag about uh, sonar or test containers because it was here and it disappeared at the beginning. So thank you very much and hope you enjoyed. Questions? Uh, first of all, thanks for the intro talk. Uh, super illustrative. Um, in terms of testing, or like more complex testing, um, how do you manage the resource usage if, for example, you have multiple tests running in parallel and they start to spin up new containers? How do you handle that? Uh, do you try to move into a test suite uh, approach? In our case, we, we, we played with different things and we reached a point where we knew that we could run three containers in parallel, but not more than three. So for instance, we were running MC and MC bucket plus the other ones, uh, but we could not run all of them. In the end, parallel, parallelism is also an illusion. So it's, uh, you can parallelize at a point and not more than that. So um, it's, it's about knowing which are your resources and to see which are the, the, the containers that you can run. In our case, Travis uh, gave us very limited resources, so the tests were taking a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of time, and also we needed to do some tricks, because if, we, if the, ta the test took more than 50 minutes, Travis was cutting the build. So we needed to reduce. In our case, we were also doing performance tests, sending big, big, uh, big requests, and we needed to, to reduce those requests just because the resources for our container in Travis were not allowing us. In, in any of those uh, resources that you shared, uh, is it possible to see some of the, like, some examples of well, you, yeah, in the slides there is the, the link to the GitHub repository of the full test, yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, so, sorry that it's not about this, but then it's about focus. Okay. <laughs> Let me, let me show you something. Let me find. I mean, the performance wins he showed were also about booting the actual application, not like uh, hundreds of requests and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so, with, yeah. I'm so trying to show you. Mostly, no? Sorry? It's a, it's a POC, yeah, it's so, not in so production. It's more important for development than anything else. I mean, I guess for uh, booting up containers is also. Yes, yeah. especially when you go to Kubernetes, you need to have a right uh, fast startup. Uh, let me. Oh, okay, here. Let me. So, this is my presentation about Quarkus. And I have. Okay. Uh, well, if you are interested, then I can give you uh, the link. Well, it's very easy. bit.ly sb2qks. That's the, that's the link. Okay, yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's below. Yeah, so these are not POCs. This is not development mode. This is a big company moving all their microservices from Spring Boot to Quarkus.
Yeah, do not use a screen boot, which 80% of the people are using. Use wire boots and screen boots uh, fast. So, yeah, performance and length, but yeah. Well, I have to say, the Spring Boot also has a Spring Native. So you should consider that. Yeah. So it, it all depends on your team. So if you have a very experienced Spring developers, why? Why do you need to, to, to change? But if you are exploring something or you don't, well, this is more subjective. Uh, this is my feeling. If you don't want to uh, be trapped in a super big monster that it is Spring Boot and then move to another thing. There are other projects. Micronaut is a super great project also, having even in some cases better performance than Quarkus and in other, well, you know. But you have uh, Micronaut, you have Quarkus. So, and the world is way, way, way bigger than only Spring. And yeah, definitely it's, it's a, a way to go because you have Lots of companies moving, and it's not that monster as a, as a Spring Boot is. So definitely check it, and it could be that it is not the right thing to use for that particular team, but it could be that it is. something that uh, really was crucial to you. You were mentioning your use case. You said that you were doing a specific container from one of the projects because it was not available as a single So my question is, how easy or how complex is to, to create a custom container out of your stack? We could say that simply any uh, container application can be run as a test container module. Or do you In our case, case it was a project from another team we only had access to the repo. Well, in Red Hat, engineering works in upstream, so everything is, is there. And they simply had like a Docker file. We didn't have any, any problem at all with that project. It could be that there are corner cases, but in, in our case, it was super easy. Just downloading and then pointing test containers to that Docker file, and that's it. No. No, 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 no. In our case, it was straightforward, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious about how you went. Uh, wow, <laughs> that's not a very good phrase. Uh, I'm curious about how you um, managed to keep especially databases like tables and schemas and everything uh, in sync between all the test suite and uh, production in such a way where uh, it was not like interfering with developer uh, velocity, if that makes sense. But because if you need to define like uh, all the schemas on your test suite and that all depends on everything, uh, on what's going on on the testing side and then you have to also define the schemas for production. I'm just wondering if you have a single source of truth or how did you handle this? In this case, it was not a super complicated thing. And in our case, we were using Flyway. So with Flyway, you have also, if I'm not wrong, uh, we had uh, files that were just uh, being run in test uh, at the beginning of uh, running the, the database and everything was populated. But the, tricky, the trick here is, yeah, when you create test um, files or definition files, population files for your database, how representative of the reality are those files? It's complicated. How many, file, how many rows are you going to insert? Uh, which corner cases are you going to add to your test that are really a representation of the reality. I think this is also part of the, the good definition of the test, uh, that the test is not only knowing that all the lines are covered or that you have so many tests, it's that the tests are testing what it is supposed to be tested. And that's, that's also important and it's tricky yeah. because you are not going to add 35 million rows in that te test case. You need to add those that are giving you some confidence. Yeah. Could you give us an example of what a, uh, a 
test that you're really proud of that you did within this project, if it's like uh, not confidential? In this case, was not. I wasn't difficult. Yeah, you said. Yeah. yeah, no, it wasn't so difficult. Here, the challenge was more about the asynchronicity. The challenge was not about the database or so. It was more about, OK, we had a test that we were sending a request. And we were expecting to receive a response. And that response came from the eight different layers. And yeah, we were checking that the result was OK. And that case, it meant that all the layers were working fine. And, and with the, with the right parameters, the right timeouts, uh, so that was most, uh, yeah, that was the, the important part here, not basically uh, the database stress. Yeah. Thank you very Yeah, the thing is that my first suggestion is only go to microservices where when you only have that option. <laughs> microservices are simply moving the complexity in the code to the complexity on orchestrating the, the services. And every time that you have services calling other services and atomicity of calls, that you have like the saga pattern where this call starts here, moves to three different microservices, but if something fails in the middle, I need to roll back all of them. Uh, well, this, it's super tricky. In this case, I think that uh, you need always to have an end-to-end -end test that is going to test the whole, th the whole way, but the, that test is going to cost a lot. In, the, in our case, it was not a complicated uh, application at all, and it took 50 minutes to run everything. If you want to do important end-to-end -end tests, it's going to take a lot of time. You need a lot of resources to run those tests. But I think it's the only thing that is going to give you confidence. If you are mocking services, yes, you can have, in, in fact, it's like the pyramid of tests, right? So you will have a lot of unit tests. You will have a lot of uh, integration tests, mocking things. But then you also need uh, tests that are covering the full, the full flow. In those cases, you, will, you are going to have few of them only. In our case, we had the other tests too. But we wanted to have this in order to check the whole, uh, but it, it, it has a cost. So in that case, uh, well, if you have uh, telemetry at that time, we didn't have telemetry on that. And then you have tracing. And then you can check that uh, a request is going through all the services and coming back to you. And then you can check for that, that tracing. So in that case, you can see that the flow is happening the, the right way. Uh, obviously. Uh, Today, I wouldn't do any microservice approach without tracing. Uh, because if not, it's like, yeah, you can add headers everywhere and then check headers, but that's not the, the way to do. Did, did I answer your question? Yes. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.